wonderful as usual. Thank you, Beth Mariko, for that. And uh, thank you all for coming uh, today, especially the kids are, who are here today. I've got a question for you to think about uh, this morning. Just to think about it. It's a big question. How do you know God exists? How do you know God exists? Does God exist? Now, some may say that's a pretty silly question because, of course, God exists. That's why we're here. That's why we have church. That's why we come to this place. That's why we're Christian people. Of course, God exists. Others would say, they're honest, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'd like to believe God exists, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Other people would say, no, no, God doesn't exist. God, doesn't, prove it. Prove it. Show me the evidence. Show me the science. How do I know God exists? Show me the proof. So it's an interesting question. How do we know God exists? How do we know God exists? So I can tell you this much. There are some things in this world that are true even if you can't prove it. Just because you can't prove something doesn't mean it isn't true. Just because there isn't evidence for something doesn't mean it isn't real. Science doesn't know everything. Science doesn't know everything. For example, you know when you're really tired and you yawn because you're tired? Don't know why they do that, why we do that. Doctors don't know why we yawn. They have some ideas, but we don't know for sure. They don't know why. I thought that was pretty interesting. They, they even know less about why yawning is contagious. Did you know that? Yawning is contagious? If you're in a, room, a group of people and somebody yawns, it's more than likely somebody else, maybe a few more people in the group are going to yawn too. They don't know why. Don't know why. I also read about um, a wild mushroom that grows in Japan. And the only other place it grows is in Texas. And they don't know why. They don't know why. It's not like somebody took it from Japan and planted it. It's always been there. Always been there. No idea why. They don't know. They don't know. Science doesn't know why. People have sometimes have strange experiences, too, that they can't explain. I had a strange experience this past week. I went to bed. I was really tired, yawned, went to bed. And I slept for eight hours, which was great for me because I have all kinds of trouble sleeping. That's another story. But I slept for eight hours. So I get up and I start my day, go to make breakfast. I look at the clock. It was not eight hours. It was one hour. It was one hour. And that seemed really weird to me. I could not explain that. Something was wrong. Something was wrong with time. What happened to those other seven hours? Because I am yeah, still kind of convinced that it was eight, but it was one. And I can't explain that. Of course, I convinced myself, well, the clock's got to be right. I don't know. I don't know. Couldn't explain it. People come to me uh, and talk to me as a pastor about a lot of different things. And I'm so grateful that people feel comfortable coming to me to talk about things. And you'd be surprised how, over the years, people share with me in the course of conversations about things that happen to them that they can't explain. They might see something that shouldn't be there or hear something that they can't explain or other people don't hear. It's not scary. In fact, most of the time, it makes them feel good, it makes them feel happy, it makes them feel joyful. Maybe they see an angel or they see someone who's passed away that they love and they see them again and they can't explain it. They can't explain it. And so they tell other people about it and the other people say, ah, don't be silly, don't be silly. And so they don't talk about it, but they talk to me about it. And so I have a sense that it happens more often than you think. More often than you think things that happen that we can't explain. So what does that mean about God, though? What does that mean about God? Oh, I can't introduce you to God like I can introduce you to, to like, Beth Hampson, right? Because, I don't know, maybe Beth Hampson's God. I don't know, but, <laughs> see? <laughs> they all think so. Um, but God's not here, like, as a person that I can introduce you to God that way. Uh, I could point to the Bible, Right, and tell you, well, here's the Bible. Bible's 
proof, God, evidence that God exists, but you might say, well, that's not science, and you'd be right. A science textbook is very different than the Bible, right? A science textbook is trying to answer how things happen in the world. Bible is trying to answer the question, who? How and who? Two different questions, two different starting places. But here's a way you might think about it. You might think about God and how God exists, how we know God exists. Have you ever seen the wind? No, you've never seen the wind because the wind's invisible, right? You can't see the wind. So how do you know the wind exists? Well, you know the wind exists because you can see what the wind's doing, right? You can see the wind blowing the trees around, blowing the, blowing the leaves around this time of year. So you know there's, the wind is out there working, right? Out there blowing around. You can see what the wind does. You can feel the wind, right? If you're out in the wind, you can feel the wind blowing on your face, blowing your hair around. Uh, if you blow on the back of your hand, you can feel that, right? You can feel the wind. You can also hear the wind, right? If you're lying in bed at night and there's a windstorm going out on outside, you don't even need to look out the window. You can hear it, right? The window rattles or the tree branches are going out there. So you can hear the wind. It's kind of the same thing with God. We can't see God like we might see other people, but we know God is here and God is real and God is working because we can see what God does. We can see the acts of love that happen in the world, the good things that happen in the world, uh, and, and the healing that happens and the hope that happens in the world. That for us is how we see God happening in the world. We can feel God, like we, can, like we can feel the wind. We can feel God in our hearts, in our lives. You know that feeling. You know that feeling you get. It, ah, you just know it. It's like, it's like if you're out in the cold and it's wintertime and it's freezing, you're freezing and you're wet and you're cold and everything, and you come inside and your parents wrap you up in a blanket and they give you a hot chocolate and they sit you on the couch and you, they read a story to you. And you're just, you're just, ah, yeah, just there. You know that. That, that feeling. That feeling is how we feel God that in our lives. We can also hear God. We can also hear God. Now, maybe not with our ears. Some people might, but most people not with their ears. Um, but we feel God, or talk, we hear God when we pray. If we're praying to God about um, a problem that we have in our lives or a decision that we have to make, we can hear God in our hearts telling us, Hey, go this way, or go that way, or decide this, or decide that, or know this, know that. We hear God in who we are. So we can see God by the acts of love in the world. We can feel God in our lives, in our hearts, that feeling we get. And we can hear God in, uh, in, our, in our lives, too, when we pray. How do you know God exists? Well, you know my answer. What's your answer? It doesn't have to be the same as my answer, and that's, that's okay if it's not. But you do need an answer. You do need an answer. So think about that. How do you know God exists? All right, we'll catch up again next week. Well, a few uh, announcements to... Uh, alert you to here uh, on uh, in your bulletin and a little bit beyond uh, we're entering now into the holiday season and that starts with next Sunday it's Halloween it's Halloween okay I won't do that again <laughs> uh, Halloween is uh, coming up it's not often that it falls on a Sunday uh, so the youth group of our church middle school and high school are putting together a Halloween party as per usual uh, for the youth or, or for the young kids in uh, in the church. In fact, they're working on that right now. They're out tracking down where the uh, uh, decorations are and planning games and such. So next Sunday uh, after worship will be um, a Halloween party on the front lawn for uh, the younger kids in our church and wider community if they'd like to come by too. So that's next Sunday. Kids are, in, are welcome to come in costume too. If you have kids, they're welcome to come in their Halloween costumes next Sunday. So we got Halloween, then we got Thanksgiving coming up. We had a great meeting after worship last Sunday about planning for that Sunday and, and for the fair as well, uh, Christmas fair. 
uh, so we have plans in the works for Hall or, uh, <laughs> Thanksgiving uh, Sunday. Because of the pandemic, we're not gonna be able to do the Thanksgiving dinner as we typically do in the Narthex, but uh, we'll be having a special uh, food uh, pantry collection of goods. There's a list of things that are needed here uh, for the two pantries in town. So we're hoping to get a great influx of uh, uh, donations for the food pantries on that Sunday. We'll do a special blessing over those contributions next uh, on that Sunday. Um, there'll also be uh, uh, the Advent workshop uh, accompanying that. Trish Farrow works on that every year. So there's an there'll be intergenerational um, craft uh, opportunities that, so that you can have something from the church to take home with you. Uh, for Thanksgiving and for Advent. Uh, that'll be happening on that Sunday. Uh, and there'll also be uh, hot cocoa uh, for afterwards outside uh, in place of coffee hour. And uh, we're working on also what kind of decorating we might be doing with uh, in, in the interior of the church for uh, Advent and Christmas also on Thanksgiving Sunday. So there'll be a lot of stuff going on after worship uh, in place of the dinner. Uh, that we normally would have. So it's a great Sunday coming up on the 21st of November. With regard to the Christmas fair, we are going to be doing some activities for that. We're really limited uh, in how we're approaching the pandemic. Um, but December 3rd and 4th, which is home for the holidays, um, again, thanks for all the feedback we got at the meeting before uh, last Sunday. Uh, we'll be having some uh, events outside the church on those two days. Uh, there'll be, in place of these gingerbread houses, we'll be doing decorating of gingerbread people, cookies. Um, uh, for the kids, uh, Sally Clem is, is uh, uh, championing that cause, if you'd like to help out with that. Also have uh, a raffle basket. The raffle basket is gonna be a little bit different. Uh, our hope is to have like one, maybe two, most three, really big ones, really big ones, like really good ones. Uh, that we're going to raffle or have as door prizes, that sort of thing. Uh, Beth Hampson is working on that. Uh, we're also going to be doing a wine poll, which I had never heard of, but it's really cool. It's a, it's a chance uh, to uh, take a chance to um, uh, win a bottle of wine. That uh, it, it's, it's really, it's kind of, I won't go into how it works, but it's really simple and it's a lot of fun. So Jim and Lisa Osterman are working on that. Um, so if you want to participate in any of those things that are going on that will be happening for our Christmas fair, you're more than welcome. A uh, reminder about the offering. Uh, we don't do it uh, in, in, the, in the pews. Uh, it's contactless right now. Uh, and we're trying something new this week, and we'll be hopefully going forward. The greeters who greeted you on the way in will have uh, offering plates uh, with them uh, on your exit in, as you exit into the narthex. A little bit easier to see, I think. The, uh, boxes you're welcome to use those as well if you'd like but uh, uh, the uh, plates will be available too so you can more readily see those uh, on your way out for contributions this morning um, so right now as we uh, listen to the doxology please do contemplate your contribution to our church uh, in the spirit of what Richard shared uh, we are in the midst of our fall stewardship uh, campaign for 2022 so be thoughtful about that as we listen to our doxology this morning we remain in the Gospel of Mark with the uh, lectionary, and I invite you to hear these words from the 10th chapter. They came to Jericho, and he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, and as they did so, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then he sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still. And he said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him 
upon the way. Here ends our scripture lessons for this morning. May God add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of these holy words. Will you pray with me? Compassionate Creator, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our minds and our hearts bring us into deeper relationship with you, you who are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, you know, if you were blind in Jesus' day, you had very, very few options. If you were lucky, your family would shelter you and take care of you, and your community would look out for you, too. That would be a rare thing, though, because we read elsewhere in the Bible of how people almost naturally assumed that a disability was evidence of a sin on someone's behalf. So if that kind of family and community support was not available to you, you were kind of out of luck. You were reduced to begging as your only option for survival. That's what happened to Bartimaeus. That's what he was reduced to, begging by the roadside in Jericho. Bartimaeus was in an extremely disadvantaged position. But you know what? Many people are. In fact, you never really know what disadvantages people around you might be facing, might be dealing with. You may never really know their struggles, and they may never really know yours. Not all disadvantages and struggles are physical. Many are emotional. Many are mental. Many are spiritual. Some people are handicapped by a negative attitude or anger management problems. Some people are anxious to the point of panic a good deal of the time. Some people are depressed and they hide it so very well. Those are challenges that you don't see, that people don't want you to see. Challenges maybe you have, but they're just as real, and they're universal. That's why Bartimaeus is such an important figure in the New Testament. He represents all of us at some level. We don't actually, in fact, know his given name. Because Bartimaeus simply means son of Timaeus. And maybe we don't know his given name because it's ours. And that's good. Because not only does he represent our own challenges and struggles and disadvantages, he also represents our possibilities. Because here's a secret. Bartimaeus wasn't actually blind. And a hush fell over the room. Well, (laughs) Bartimaeus wasn't actually blind, and by that I mean that sure, he wasn't able to see with his eyes, but he had very clear vision in another way, a more important way. Our eyes. We rely on them so much. We depend on our eyes as the strongest and most important of our five senses. And yet... They limit us. They trick us. They trick us into believing that what we see is all that there is. They can, in the end, even be a source of our disability in that way. Let me show you what I mean. I sometimes do this uh, in a confirmation class, but how do you picture Jesus? I mean, when you think about Jesus, what does he look like? To you. Now, with that question, most people, most of you, will describe what you think about his features, how you picture him, his face, his eyes, his skin color, his hair, his beard, if he has one, his height, is he tall, is he short? But now I invite you to close your eyes for a moment, keep them closed. And now, picture Jesus. Now, 
what do you see when you see Jesus? If you stay with that, if you're like most people, your description will change. Most people, with their eyes closed, will not describe how Jesus looks. They will describe him from a spiritual place. They will say things like, Jesus is kind. Jesus is loving. Jesus is warm. Jesus is light. It's more about feeling. So what's the difference? Well, when your eyes were closed, you saw Jesus with your spiritual eyes. You perceived Jesus differently, and I would venture to say, more accurately. Because faith is not about physical evidence. It's about feelings. It's about the heart. It's about intuition. It's about awareness. It's about attentiveness to something inside you that says, this isn't all there is. There is something beyond all of this, something beyond our physical realm. If I say to you, Jesus is with you, and you look around, you don't see Jesus, you say, well, no, he's not. But if I tell you to close your eyes for a moment, and then I say, Jesus is with you, you are more likely to say, Yes, he is. Because you see him in your heart. You see him in your intuition, in your mind. You can feel that he's there. It isn't, a, it isn't about physically seeing him. It's about seeing him with your spirit. And that kind of seeing is believing. And I think that's how Bartimaeus saw and I think that because how else would he have been so able to trust so immediately and with such determination that Jesus was the Son of God? Because nearly everybody else, especially people who should have known better, saw him as a man, as a rabbi, just somebody with an interesting point of view. But not Bartimaeus. He is the one in the story who already sees Jesus the best. And he calls out to him because he recognizes him. He recognizes him for who he really is. And he asks Jesus to let him see. He asks Jesus to let him see because he wants to see the man he already knew and recognized in his heart. He wanted to see so that he could follow him on the way which is what he did. And his story is enshrined in the Bible because he is all of us, blind and begging our way forward through this life sometimes. And he is also all of us because he could really, really see. And he used his true vision, the vision of his heart, to see Jesus as he truly is. So whatever your struggle, whatever your challenge, whatever your pain, your hurt, even if it feels like you are reduced to begging by the roadside, refine the eyesight of your heart. See with your eyes closed. Find and know Jesus there. Know he is real. Know he is with you. Know that if you call out to him, he will free you and heal you and invite you to follow him on the way. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, we want to see. We want eyes to see and ears to hear you. You in our lives each and every day, each and every night. And that is the gift. That is the healing that you offer us in Christ. And when we see you and find you in our lives, may we reach out in your spirit to others so that they can have clear vision as well. 
So we pray now for the faith to reflect your love and compassion and equity to those most in need of your touch in their lives. Guide us to be your people and your church in this world that is in such need of hope and unity and purpose. Thank you, O oh God, for the insight that you give us. For it deepens our faith in you and ties us ever closer to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <laughs>